Good morning. I want to welcome you to our service this morning, the first day of spring, which if I understand correctly, starts at 1130. So it's not quite, but we're almost there. What a beautiful weekend it's, uh, it's been. It, it, it feels like spring and it's a, it's a great relief. Uh, speaking of spring, I've been watching the uh, NCAA tournament and our family all extended, larger family, we all fill out our brackets and have our own things so we can make fun of each other and banter back and forth. So that's been fun. Of course, everybody's bracket has been busted since the very beginning of the playoffs, more so than I've seen in I don't know how many years. Um, a lot of upsets. The thing about that tournament is, is that everything is on the line, and it's, it's basically once and done, you know? If you don't win, you fail, and you're out. Um, once and done. Imagine if that's the way it was with our Lord, with God. Once and done, you're out. You might look back at the, the fall of Adam and Eve and say, well, it was once and done. And they were out. They were literally out. Okay? Um, but the Lord provided a way through the seed of that woman, Eve. Uh, he provided a way that would come to generations that followed and to us even this morning as we come to worship that our relationship God, with God is not once and done. But Jesus paved the way so that we can have eternal life now and experience that now uh, and in the future. And that's because Jesus was the one who took the hit. He was once and done. But then he rose again. He rose again. And in that we find our hope this morning. Um, that with Jesus, um, we are forgiven. And his forgiveness extends uh, all the way into eternity. Worship him with that joy this morning as we gather. So we'll open our service responsibly using Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning to find our refuge and to find our rest in you and in your presence. We, by being here, have put aside um, the regular uh, cares and burdens of our week. And while we may come this morning heavy laden with some of those burdens. You are the one who gives us rest. So we come here to find you and to find the grace and the mercy and the compassion that you offer to your people. We come to praise you. We ask that you would show us more of yourself throughout our worship. In Jesus' name.
be seated for just a moment. If you come to the end of your week and you're looking for rest, that's our hope and prayer this morning, that today would be a day of rest. Um, We're looking into Psalm 23, and this is how we confess our faith. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Please stand as we continue our worship.
Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that I said be seated, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you, 
could stand a green one. <laughs> Um, so please uh, put some contact info, uh, how we can get a hold of you, who you are. Um, and for those of us who are a little rusty with these uh, members, also put your name and mark that you're here. That's very helpful to the staff. Um, so yeah, I just want to extend a warm welcome to, to everyone who's here this morning with us. We pray and hope, like I said before, that it's a, a day of rest, um, that we can come together and rest in Jesus and what he's done and who he is. Last month, the youth had a, their breakaway retreat, which is like all the youth from the Presbytery. Come on up, Nick. Um, I talked to Jeremy, and then I just talked to Nick uh, a, a few days after I had talked to Jeremy just about the retreat and how it went, and they were pretty excited about uh, that. So we thought, since we all were praying for that, and we, we do pray for our youth, uh, that it would be good to have hear back just a brief report on it. All right. Good morning. Tom did communicate how a lot of the congregation was praying for our weekend, and we really appreciate that. Um, we did want, I did want to spend a little bit of time just talking about youth men in general and then talk a little bit specifically about Breakaway. Uh, for those of you not engaged in youth ministry, we've been going through the book of Acts this year. It's been really, really great to interact with the youth and see how they've matured throughout this year. And we've had a number of activities this year. We've had a family retreat in September. We had one service project already happening, one upcoming. Uh, we have the Move for Life that we support. We've had two night games. And then really, in my opinion, the highlight of our youth year is Breakaway, which occurs President's Day weekend every year. Uh, many of your adult children, those of you who are a little bit older in the congregation, you remember when your children went to Breakaway. Um, I will, you know, make a plug for Jeremy Labs. He is a leader, but he went to Breakaway as a student. So a lot of history with Breakaway. And as Tom said, it is an opportunity where a ton of churches in our presbytery all get together and have way too many kids in one room for weekends. Uh, we had about 250 youth. We had about 40 or 50 leaders. So, you know, enough chaperones to keep things from getting out of hand. Um, but wanted to say, you know, we had seven students from RPC and also wanted to point out Dustin and Jeremy for coming up and supporting us during that weekend. Um, there's a lot that goes on at Breakaway. We've got worship, we've got devotions, a lot of eating. In fact, I feel like as soon as we had breakfast the one day, it was already lunch. Um, a lot of group games and activities, staying up too late. And then the other thing is having a lot of small group time. The nice thing about having only seven students from a church is you don't have to break up into separate sections like Westminster has to split up into like eight groups. Uh, we had one group, we were all together, and we had some really, really solid conversations. Um, 
get to that in a second. Uh, Breakaway this year, the topic was called Reboot. We had five sessions. Uh, it was launching new product, analyzing system crash, rebooting your system, updating system security, and then connecting to the network. And if you think about it for just a little bit, you can probably think of how the, the leader uh, was able to connect that to the gospel. So really, really good stuff. And then our youth also had an opportunity to learn about what the role of technology should be in their lives. Uh, cancel culture, that was a big one. And then how we should engage in Christian community. Uh, the one thing I really wanted to highlight this week, or this weekend that we had this past year, was our small group time. So there were seven youth, uh, eight boys, eighth through 11th grade. And we had a set of questions that we were supposed to talk about. And we had some really, really good questions where we kind of threw those, those scripted questions out the window and just started talking about all sorts of things. Um, we talked about dating. We talked about music in the church. Uh, we talked about the role of youth in the church. And then we also talked about how the you know, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th graders could serve the younger children in our church. We had some really, really awesome conversation. We went a little bit longer than we probably were supposed to in our small group time. And I know at one point we almost missed out on ice cream on Saturday night. So fortunately, we were, we were told that it was about to get put away. So we, we had some time to get there. Um, I do want to, to do a little bit of an appeal to the adults in the room. Um, not RPC, but just in general. I think there's a challenge in the church when it comes to how do you engage youth? in our church. And that's a lot of conversation that we had to break away is how do our youth get involved? And so I want to encourage you to think about that. There is a challenge where nationwide, I don't know if it's in other cultures, but in the U.S. culture, tends to be that here's youth ministry over here and then here's the rest of the church. And then when the youth go on to graduate, we don't really hear from them again because they were never really plugged in. So um, I would really encourage you to reach out to the youth in our church most of them are members. Most of them have gone through our communicants class. You know, they get to vote uh, at, at the congregational meeting. They take communion. And uh, a lot of them really want to get involved. We've had people over there doing the slides. We've had people in choir that are in youth ministry. So what I would encourage you to do is get to know our students a little bit better and invite them to be a part of what you're doing, whether you're part of a committee or there's an event going on. I would encourage you not just to reach out to the adults in the congregation, but say, hey, you know, you look like you're in middle school, high school. How about you help out? We'd love to have you be a part of our church. Uh, finally, I'd like to ask you to pray for our youth. You know, Breakaway was an awesome experience for them to experience Jesus, to experience Christian community, and they continually need that. We continually need that. So I would ask for you to pray for our youth's struggles in school. Um, you know, whether it's relationships at school or whether it's the content itself, um, there's a lot of needs there. I would pray for their participation in the church and then also for their faithfulness as they become adults. Um, you know, whether they go to, go to a trade school, go directly into the workforce, go to college, uh, whether they, you know, be, get married, have children or not, or pursue vocations or pursue missionary moments. We pray that you would ask that you pray for them, pray for them as they become more and more part of the church, the church and how God is going to use them. So thank you for your support of youth ministry at RPC. Uh, very blessed to be in the role that I'm in. Very blessed to have the Lord's faithfulness in our ministry. So thank you. Thank you, Nick. That was great. So let's, let's seek the Lord in prayer, and let's do just that. Let's pray for our youth and, and pray for the many things that are going on. So let's, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for our youth um, here in RPC. Father, we pray for their well-being. We pray that you would help us as, as adults to plug in and talk to them and, and welcome them in whenever we have the chance. Lord, I pray that you would draw our youth to yourself. I thank you for the work that you're doing through Nick and the other, other youth helpers. And Father, I thank you for the great weekend that they had at Breakaway. Lord, uh, we also want to lift up all of our covenant children to you. We thank you for all the children, um, young, young to old, that are in this church. And Lord, we, we come to you with our burdens. Um, we have burdens. Maybe, maybe there are some youth, or maybe there are people in this church whose children are not following after you. We pray for them. 
We pray that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, we we come to you for rest on this day, and there are many things. Maybe it's a, a prodigal child. Maybe it's the war in Ukraine that we're concerned about. We have angst over. So, Lord, we want to lay that at your feet. We pray for the Christians there, that they would be salt and light. Lord, we pray for your church that is in Russia. They are suffering in a different way. But, Father, we pray for them, that they too may be salt and light where they're at. We pray for comfort and encouragement for those nations around the world, the churches in those nations. We pray, Lord, that this day would be a day of rest for them. Lord, maybe there's angst or anxiety or frustration with finances, the burden of inflation and the the rising of costs of daily living. We pray, Lord, that that we would just bring these anxieties to you. We pray that uh, we would just take rest in knowing you. And, and ask for your care. We ask for your help. And we thank you, Father, for being our shepherd, for leading us in green pastures. We thank you for the rest that you offer. So it's in, in your name, Jesus, that we ask all of these things. Amen. All right, we continue our worship now by giving our tithes and offerings. So let us uh, worship the Lord in this way together. Just one. Shout Jesus from the mountain.
Thank you, Josh and Caitlin. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Luke chapter 6. I'll be reading the first 11 verses of this passage. <clears throat> Luke chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through, <clears throat> excuse me, the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he ate <clears throat> what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. And so they watched him closely to see if he would keep the Sabbath or heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and he stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was completely restored. But they were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. This is God's word to us today. Have you ever had to perform a task and you know that you're being watched? It's not a very comfortable feeling. Maybe you're a teacher and you remember those days when you were doing your student teaching and the principal walked in and you knew you are being evaluated, and even though you're an experienced teacher in a school, the principal comes in, and uh, you know you're being assessed. And maybe you feel like spot on this day, so it's good, but a lot of times you might feel like, oh boy. Did you ever, been, did you ever go out and you're driving in your car and you just notice that there's a police car that's following you? For some reason, you make a turn, and then it's like, well, the cop made a, tur a turn as well. And you start getting nervous if you're like me, and you want to do everything just right, and you're afraid that because you're so nervous, you're going to do something wrong. It's hard to be watched. I used to clean houses when I was in seminary, and there was one older woman who would just follow me around. I like the houses where nobody was there, you know, and I could do what I wanted, but this woman would sort of follow me around, and I just felt like, you know, I'm going to do something wrong just because she's watching, you know, uh, something that she doesn't like. Um, I've known pastors who fall out of favor with some in their congregation or with their elders, and when they preach, they feel like, every word that they're saying is being analyzed and filtered through 
a negative screen. I've been in that situation before. And it's really hard to just preach freely in those situations. Jesus and his disciples are being watched. They're being assessed. They're being examined by the religious authorities of their day. Most people are just happy to be with Jesus and to come to Jesus and hear his teaching, but there are some people who are not so happy. And we saw that uh, beginning back in chapter 5 when Jesus heals the paralytic, and he was there, and, and the religious leaders from all over the northern region and from Judea and Jerusalem had come to hear what he was saying. And you know it wasn't just for enjoyment to assess him. Jesus went to this banquet that Levi had at his home when he came to Christ and found freedom in Christ, and there were the religious leaders watching what was happening and asking questions. And today we have two episodes sort of joined together, and these are related to the Sabbath, and we know that Jesus is being watched. Uh, in our passage today, the Pharisees are keeping an eye on him. Now, I don't know how they knew he was walking through a wheat field. I don't know if they have drones that they send out, you know, Jesus drones to see what he's doing or exactly how that worked, if they just happened to spot him or if they were sort of really following it that closely and watching, we're not told. Uh, but Jesus is out walking through the grain fields on a Sabbath day, and his disciples pick the heads of grain, they rub them in their hands, and they eat the kernels. Now, to pick the grain was considered harvesting. To rub it in your hands is threshing. Okay? And then if you kind of blow away the chaff, now you're winnowing. And so the Pharisees confront Jesus, and they say, why are your disciples doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? You're harvesting. That's work, and the law forbids us from working on the Sabbath. What's the background for these kinds of accusations, and how do they ever get to this place? Why are they so concerned about the Sabbath? Here they are in the midst of the oppression of the Roman government. There's famine, there's poverty, there's sickness, there's not much access to health care that wealthier people might have access to. They're basically prisoners in their own land, and they're suffering. And here are the Pharisees taking a day that's supposed to be one of joy, and it feels oppressive. What's behind that? Well, one of one is this. The, the first thing is that there, there were three distinctives that made you a true Jew. One was the physical sign of circumcision. The, the other was keeping the dietary laws. And the third was keeping the Sabbath. Those were the main pillars on which your Jewishness and your, that your relationship to God really hung on in a visible way. That, of course, was based on the fourth commandment about keeping the Sabbath, and in it you shall not do any work. And then the exile that the Jews had been through perhaps made this even more of a, the Sabbath more of an anxious day than a day of rest. For instance, in Jeremiah 17, 27, it says, if you don't obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying any loads or burdens as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem and will consume her fortresses. And so the, the Jews could look back on their experience in exile and say, well, you know why that happened? It's because of breaking the Sabbath. And they could quote Jeremiah in order to prove that. So perhaps that explains 
why the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that one of, one of their chief concerns, one of their chief focuses um, was the Sabbath itself. They had discerned 39 categories of work. You want to keep it, you got to find out what work is. So they had 39 categories of work, and then there were like hundreds of rules attached to each of those categories, those uh, forms of labor that they had discerned. And the rules were written to prevent the people from breaking the fourth command. But it was all done out of fear, out of the wrong kind of fear, the fear of breaking God's law. And it was also done out of pride, pride, a, a confidence in oneself that by adhering in meticulous ways to all of these man-made laws that we would somehow be more acceptable to God and that we would be more blessed by him. There's just one problem, and it's a recurring problem, that these were man's rules and not God's rules. These were man's ways, but they, weren't man, they were not God's intentions. Let me tell you about a few of their rules. One of their biggest fears was in carrying burdens, which Jeremiah cited. And so a woman could wear a wig in her house, but not outside of it. That was working on Sunday. Okay? A, a woman could not look in a mirror, lest she be tempted in seeing a gray hair that she might remove it. Why, why are they making all these rules for women? I'm not sure why. Pharisees believe that any form of self-improvement was a sin. A living, um, a living person could be carried on a pallet without sinning, since the pallet was a necessary uh, accompaniment or accessory for those who were lame. But no one could carry a pallet without a person on it. So we understand the Pharisees' fury in John chapter 5, not just for Jesus healing this lame man on the Sabbath, but because the healed man is carrying his pallet and Jesus commanded him to do it. That awful, awful man. The Sabbath became so oppressive that rules had to be invented to make it more bearable. These aren't tax shelters, they're Sabbath shelters so that we can kind of get around some of the rules. For instance, you were allowed to journey only 2,000 cubits beyond your dwelling place on the Sabbath. That's about a mile. Um, so how are you going to visit Uncle Joe, who lives two miles away? Well, the day before, you walk a mile, and then you set down your food, okay? Now, I don't know, like, did everybody do this? I mean, you're walking around the road on Saturday evening. It's like, oh, there's food, there's food. I, I don't know how this works. I don't know if you hid your food somewhere, but you set your food 2,000 cubits out, and then you come home, and then the next day you go out, and you come 2,000 cubits, but because there's food there, it constitutes a dwelling place. Okay? So you go from one dwelling place, and then you can go the other 2,000 cubits uh, from that point, and you can have your time with Uncle Joe or whoever. And you see, it's that kind of legalism that they're throwing at Jesus. The rules forbade the disciples from harvesting and sifting, and so they accuse Jesus. Why are you doing what is unlawful? So how does Jesus respond? Well, first, he explains to them that what he's doing really isn't unlawful. And he backs it up with a passage, a, a story from the Old Testament. Uh, it's, it's about David, and he says, haven't you read about David? Which in some ways is... Huh, it's an expression, have you not read? 
but there has to be a little bit of a bite to it, to the people he's talking to, because of course they've read these things. They know these things backwards and forwards. But Jesus says, have you never read um, how David, and this is in 1 Samuel 21, we actually looked at this passage in our uh, class uh, that we've been studying in, in uh, Samuel, Kings, and uh, Chronicles upstairs. Um, David, in 1 Samuel 21, comes to the tabernacle, and he and his men are hungry, and so he goes into the house of God, he goes into the tabernacle, and with the priest's permission, he eats the consecrated bread, the show bread, that, has, that is put out daily within the tabernacle. Now, only the priests were allowed to eat this bread. It was for them. It was consecrated. But in David's case, he's allowed to do this, and he's never condemned. So Jesus brings that up. Have you never read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God, he took the consecrated bread, and he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat, and he also gave it to his companions. Jesus is saying, look what King David, God's anointed one, was permitted to do and his followers. They were in need. And the ministry of the tabernacle and the rules that were associated with the tabernacle were set aside uh, for the sake of the anointed one. What was untouchable, David was allowed to touch. And he was allowed to eat and his companions. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying that David and his ministry at that time, the urgency of fleeing from Saul and the safety of his life was more important than the tabernacle ministry. David is greater than the tabernacle in that sense. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, someone greater than David is here. I'm greater than King David. If the lesser could do this, the greater certainly can do this as well. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And what a, an incredible statement. And we're in a series entitled, Who is This Man? And we're trying to look at that from the perspective of people who are meeting Jesus and seeing him and they're marveling and they're wondering and they're saying, we, we have seen amazing things today and people are watching him and hearing what he says and, and as they do, they're learning more about him and as we move through the Gospel of Luke, we're learning more about him too and we have to realize that this is an answer to that question, who is this man? That He is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus uh, is saying, um, you're not the Lord of the Sabbath, Pharisees. I am Lord of the Sabbath. And what if, I think if he said God is Lord of the Sabbath? But he says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Pharisees had taken the Sabbath, which was made for man. It's made for man's good. I mean, isn't it good that God built into how we were made, modeled after his own creation? He built into it a day where we could say, you know, I, I have a right to rest on this day. Now, maybe you don't always feel like that, okay? There are Sabbath days, Lord's Day, as we call it, that come along, and, and uh, they don't feel restful. But we have a right, okay? We have uh, more than just a permission slip from God. We have a, a command to say, this is for your good. You need to rest. It was made for man. It was made for the whole person. It was, um, it, it was to be, you know, a, a day not of fear, but a day of delight. It was supposed to be a day not of oppression, but a day of renewal. Jesus' claim here is, this is my day, not yours. I, I'm claiming it back. I'm kind of reminded here of when 
Jesus cleanses the temple. And, you know, the temple ministry was designed, if you look at the passages where the temple was dedicated, it was a house of prayer. It was a place where man meets God, where there's, there's this communion between God and man, and where forgiveness and redemption and renewal and joy is found in the presence of God. That's what it was all about. And Jesus comes into the, the temple on, uh, after his triumphant entry, and it's just, it's a circus. It's a, it's a cash cow. It's a money-making machine for those who operate the temple because to offer your, to, to give your offerings, whatever your income levels, everything was for sale and only those were accepted in the temple. And it's just a noisy place of commotion and commerce. And Jesus says, enough. Turns the tables over, gets out a whip and the animals go out and they scurry and he says, this is to be a house of prayer. And in a way, Jesus, in a, in a softer way, is coming to show the true purpose of the Sabbath here. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. You know, it, it's the same with all of the laws that the Pharisees had in many ways distorted. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is always saying, you have heard it said. You have heard it said. You have heard it said. And normally when he says that, he's talking about what man has done with God's intentions. And they're not good. it's not good. It's not a good picture. But I say to you, Jesus comes to show us the true meaning of what the law is. He didn't come to abolish the law, to, but fulfill it and to show the true intention of it. And that's what he's saying in our passage. He's saying, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, not you Pharisees. You've succeeded in ruining this with your set of rules that only serve to oppress people. But it's my day, and I'm taking it back. There's more to this claim than meets the eye, though, because what Jesus is really saying here is that he's claiming to be God. You can't say, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, without making a claim to your own identity that you yourself are God. He's the Son of Man and Son of God. In six days, God created the world. He rested from his labors. And on the seventh day, he entered into the enjoyment of what he had made. Think about that. He, he, he makes the world, he makes the universe. And the seventh day is not a day where, of simple abstention. It's a day of entering into and enjoying. That's the Sabbath of God himself. And Jesus is saying here, I'm Lord of this day. I made this day. I was there when the earth was made and the seas and the skies and the stars and all of these things. I'm the one who created this earth. And I'm the one who's going to administer it. I'm the one who's going to regulate it. Earlier when Jesus healed the paralytic, he claimed to forgive sins and the Pharisees were in an uproar because only God can redeem. Only God can forgive sins. Redemption's for God, but do you see what Jesus is saying here? He's making a claim, not just about redemption, but about creation. I am Lord of the Sabbath. I suppose here as well we also see, and maybe it's just a hint of it, but I think we see the priority of Jesus' mission. What is Jesus' mission? In, in chapter 4, verse 43 of Luke's gospel, we, we read that Jesus, he has to move on because as I have to preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that is why I was sent. And in chapter 5, when, Jesus, when the disciples are fishing, uh, Anthony preached that Sunday and he showed us how how uh, the intention of Jesus 
was to make these disciples actually who are really good at fishing to make them fishers of men. That's what their mission is about. And here he is with the disciples, and I, I just can't ignore this. I'm not trying to allegorize what's happened, but what's he doing? He's harvesting. Okay? This isn't just the Lord of the Sabbath. This is the Lord of the harvest. And he's with these disciples who are to be fishers of men and who are to be there to, to, to uh, be a part of the harvest that is, is here and now and the harvest that is coming. And the Pharisees are right. He is harvesting. That is what he's about. That's what his mission is. But my harvest, the priority of my mission, Jesus says, supersedes everything. It's not just that I'm greater than David, okay, or I'm greater than the temple, but the kingdom and the harvest of the kingdom supersedes everything. Someone greater than David is here, and his mission is much greater, and his mission is central. Allow my, when you think about Jesus' mission, his kingdom mission, what, what, was, what was he doing? Well, Jesus' role in his earthly ministry was to allow his people to enter into a real Sabbath with God. Not just a earthly seven-day cycle. Okay? But his real mission was to pave the way so that we can have an eternal Sabbath with God. A future Sabbath with God. When everything is made new and we really are renewed and we, we are raised from the dead and we have new bodies and, and the cares and suffering of this world are cast aside and we're in the presence of God and in the new heaven, the, the, the new earth and, the, and heaven above. And what an ordeal Jesus would go through to make that rest possible. He labored to the very end of the sixth day until he could exclaim on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. It is accomplished. Not creation, but redemption. And his resurrection on the first day, not the seventh, but on the first day, inaugurates a whole new rest for his people. But we're almost out of time. Um, and we haven't even gotten to the second <laughs> miracle that's here, or the, or the miracle in the second episode that is here. But just to summarize, it says here that they were watching Jesus, okay? They were looking for something to accuse him of. And, you know, they could have brought in someone who had a shriveled hand or some other thing and said, let's see what he does. You know, but that's not, how, that's not what we're told here. That there was someone present who needed healing and and they're extra excited because it's like, what's he going to do? Their antenna are up. He's in the synagogue teaching. And we read here, just as we did with the paralytic, that Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. Um, he's not afraid of being watched. He, he sees it as an opportunity to teach and to show who he really is and what God's priorities really are. He knows what they're thinking, and so he asks this guy, I want you to get up, and I want you to stand up here in front of everybody. So the guy does. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy a life? Which is it? Silence. They don't, they don't know what to say. Mark's gospel, actually, parallel passage, Mark notes the silence. There's no answer. Because the question puts them in an awkward spot. You know, Jesus isn't contrasting between doing good and doing nothing. He's not contrasting doing evil or doing nothing. Those aren't the choices. 
The choice is between doing good or doing evil. And if doing nothing was one of the choices, the Pharisees would have opted for that. Because doing nothing was really their view of the Sabbath. Do nothing. Be safe. Just in case you might break it, but Jesus' alternatives are doing good or doing evil. Saving a life or destroying it. The Pharisees couldn't answer. To choose evil was obviously sin, but to choose good could be mean you're opening the floodgates to sin and you're opening the floodgates to all kinds of good activities on the Sabbath that they hadn't legislated. They don't want to open that door. See what Jesus is really saying is that failing to do good is really evil. You fail to do good. You're going to do good or are you going to do evil? To fail to do good when you need to do good, is evil. To do nothing is evil. It would be wrong. Pharisees were watching him. They're looking for a way to accuse him, and here in this great moment of irony, he's accusing them. Okay? He's accusing them in not so subtle ways. So over in chapter 13, there's this woman in the synagogue, and Jesus heals her, and they were indignant because he healed on the Sabbath. And, and he says, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then why won't this woman, a daughter of Abraham, why would you keep her bound for these last 18 years and not set her, see, set her free on the Sabbath? And when he said this, his opponents were humiliated. And the people were delighted with the wonderful things that he was doing, which is why our passage ends with them being furious and wanting to discuss what they should do with Jesus. In Matthew's account, it says they plotted, they began to plot for ways to kill him. Because he was bucking the whole system that they had set up. And it was too dangerous. Jesus was a dangerous man. One takeaway from this is simply that this, the Sabbath was made for us to do good. It's not, you know, it's not just we don't leave the ox in the ditch or get the sheep out of, you know, where, where the sheep fell or, or we lead cattle so they can drink water. What about people? What about people who need to be delivered? What about people whose life is in the ditch? Jesus says that can't wait. That's part of our work and that's part of our rest on the Sabbath. And that is to give life to others. Giving life, life-giving activities for others. So maybe you're teaching Sunday school today and you don't feel like you're resting. Okay? It's supposed to be a day of rest, but you're giving life. I spent my whole ministry breaking the Sabbath. You know, it's not you know it's a it's a it's a long it's a it's a long day. You know, start at four thirty for me this morning. I'll get home at one. I'll take a nap. Um, and and all these years, you know, especially raising our kids, you know, my good wife Linda, um, you know, especially when we had two services. You know, and the service starts at 8 o'clock or 8.15, you know, I was never there to help with the three kids, you know, get them ready for church. She, she did it all alone. She was breaking the Sabbath in a way because I was breaking the Sabbath. But why, why am I called to this ministry? To, to give life. And you're called to give life. And it's not just through teaching. It's through Anything else, it's things you do with your family today that are life-giving, that are nurturing, that even if some of the moments are tense or you're like, oh boy, this isn't going right. But over the long haul in your family life, as you're life-givers on this day, you know, it, it's a joyful day. It's a day where you can think about, well, how can I extend mercy to someone else? 
Because mercy always trumps sacrifice. You don't come to church on Sunday because you hit some situation on the way to church or something else happened, and you show mercy. You're doing exactly what God wants you to do. Because mercy always trumps sacrifice. It trumps the, the, the regular gathering of God's people. So think of how you can take this day as Jesus took this day and how you can build into it restoration, renewal. Sometimes that takes planning ahead on the other days so that you can enjoy it more. But that's why God has given it to us. And that's why we call Jesus, the one we worship, the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, take uh, these words from your son. Uh, Strong words. Words of identity. And let us remember that this is the one that we serve. The one who's freed us, not oppressed us. The one who's lifted us up and not left us where we were. The one who looks to do good as opposed to doing nothing. We pray this in your name. words of peace if you'll extend your hands now may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god the father the fellowship of the holy spirit rest and abide with you all amen you may be seated the children are dismissed to the music room and sunday school hour All right, if you would look in your bulletins, we have uh, several uh, things coming up here at church. Um, ladies' night, movie night out, so maybe you uh, husbands can care for the kiddos that night and let your wife come to church. Um, sign up begins today, and also uh, thank you uh, for all of you who donated snacks to the children's ministry. Uh, the response was overwhelming. Thank you very much for that. Uh, kids summer program 
Should we, should we have it take the QR survey? It's on the back of the uh, bulletin. Um, also note, uh, this guy is retiring and June 10th is the date, so mark that on your calendars um, for, uh, for his retirement party. And also a note from Debbie that church office will be closed this Friday. Uh, no one will be in. Um, also wanted to make a special note for the Family Matters for Prayer and Praise. Um, you see in there there's some, some uh, serious things, uh, especially for Herb. We want to pray for him. Um, so, yeah, just look over that. Make sure you're praying for your fellow brothers and sisters this week. And uh, also, uh, I ha happen to know uh, Uncle Joe, whose house we couldn't travel to because he's a little too far away, is teaching Sunday school, so he's on the third floor. Also, show them Jesus classes on the second floor. We'd love to have you join us for that. So have a blessed Lord's Day. Uh, go in peace.